Good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I think well, we still have people joining, but uh, we will make a start. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for this event. My name is Alistair Curry. I am the Head of Campaigns and Communications here at Population Matters. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be involved in the launch of this great report, Breaking Silos. And I'll just make, make a few more comments about the report uh, and also talk about how the webinar is going to work little later. The chat function is not working at the moment and I'll explain more later. Um, first of all, just for those of you who are not familiar with us, let me just tell you a little bit about Population Matters. Population Matters is a UK-based charity working internationally to promote sustainable population, to protect the natural world and to improve people's lives. As we will be hearing more of um, in this session, in this webinar, population growth holds back people from leading, leading the lives they deserve. It's a key driver of our environmental crisis. And it's one of the many factors, but one of the factors that is that at the moment is pressing against us achieving the sustainable development goals, which as you all know, are way off track at the moment. That doesn't mean of course that population is our own problem, not by a long way. Addressing population is just one thing that's needed, one piece of the jigsaw in sorting out our world. A population matters, the reason that we work on this particular piece of the jigsaw is because the solutions, the things that help to address population growth are all things that actually empower and improve lives. And it's our opportunity to support those things. The reality is that the reason our population, global population has been growing the way it has been at the pace it has been is because of our collective failure to achieve gender equality, to ensure that everyone has the education that they need and deserve to end poverty and inequality, to ensure that pregnancy and childbirth are safe and that children can live and thrive. And another failure particularly relevant to, to today is our failure to ensure that everyone has got the means, the opportunity and the choice to decide how, how big their family should be. In particular through our still failure in 2024 to meet the unmet need for contraception for hundreds of women across the world. These are rights to which everyone is entitled and our job at Population Matters is to put our shoulder to the wheel and help to advance those solutions, which we do in many different ways. I will give you a, a, a long list. You can have a look at our website at our annual report for more of that. But that includes supporting grassroots projects, delivering sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender work at community level, it includes gathering um, stakeholders and policymakers together to talk about the issues and identify solutions that work for them, as we've done very recently and very successfully in Nigeria. It involves campaigning to, um, you know, to remove the barriers or to advocate the removal of, of the barriers that prevent people having a free choice. And we're just starting a uh, a, a collaboration with, with some organizations in India to look at the um, barriers to girls' education there. Uh, it involves amplifying voices of people from marginalized communities. It also involves communicating to people like myself, people who live in high income, high environmental impact countries about the advantages of choosing smaller families and, um, and about the advantage of the essential, uh, how essential it is that we should moderate our consumption and a, address the forces that lead to unsustainable consumption. So communication is a very key part of what it is we do at Population Matters, which is one of the reasons why we're so pleased to be able to support the, the launch and publicity for the Breaking Silos report. This is an independent report written by three experts in the field, Celine Delacroix, Joe Spidel, and Karen Hardy. Uh, and the, um, I think I'll let them speak for themselves. We're going to hear from Celine and Joe uh, just very shortly, uh, but I hope that you will agree with me that the, the report makes a very compelling case for taking a holistic approach and breaking down some of the barriers between sectors that have existed for quite a long time. Uh, in addition to hearing from Celine and Joe, we'll also hear from Population Matters content and campaign specialist Florence Blondell, who's going to the Commission on the Status of Women UN meeting in New York next week, whose theme is accelerating gender equality through tackling poverty. And uh, Florence will be telling us about the research and the briefing that she's just produced 
looking at those issues. Between them, I think these three presentations really convey very strongly the importance and the opportunity that we have if we work together in order to advance these, these vital causes. So just going on to sort of the mechanics uh, that, that we have here, we'll have the three presentations, which should take around about 40 minutes, allowing 20 minutes or so for a QA and a um, at the end. As I said, the chat facility is not uh, available or working so that we can concentrate on the presentations. So if you have questions, please put them in the, um, in the Q&A section using, using the button at the bottom. That won't automatically appear on screen, but we'll try and push those through. They will be seen by myself and the panelists, and we will select questions where we're not able Able to answer questions at the moment um, we will try to do it afterwards if you're asking a question please say who you are and if you're from an organization please say what organization that, that is so that we can get back to you a recording will be put online of this of the whole seminar hopefully tomorrow but if not tomorrow then within days so um following all that it just reminds me for me to introduce our first speaker uh, celine delacroix um Celine uh, um, is an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa and the director of the FP Earth Project. Her interdisciplinary research focuses on exploring ways to better understand and harness the linkages between reproductive rights, population dynamics, and environmental sustainability. Her background is in law, environmental science, and population health. Celine, over to you. Thank you so much, Alice Bear. Um, and, uh... Very happy to be here. I'm speaking from a beautiful, sunny and warm morning in uh, Quebec, in Canada. Um, and uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, the funder for um, for this report, which is the the Reden Foundation, and also thank uh, Population Matters for um, uh, coordinating the. Um, uh, basically coordinating the publication of the report. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, great. So let, let's get on to it. Um, so this year marks uh, the 30th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development, um, the ICPD, as we, as we know it. Uh, it was held in 1994 in Cairo, and it's uh, often referred to as the Cairo Consensus. Uh, on many different levels, the ICPD marked a turning point for uh, reproductive rights, and uh, the ICPD can really be celebrated as having been instrumental in uh, the promotion of reproductive health, uh, individual rights, and uh, women's empowerment on, on a global scale. Uh, but there's still obviously a, a, lot, a lot more work to do um, as progress for reproductive rights is unacceptably slow. Um, and this category of rights as a whole remains largely unacknowledged and um, underfunded and under threat. Um, a few statistics really illustrate this, so I, I won't go in, in much uh, detail on this, but I, I want to just give you two, which is the uh, um, the number, the, the global number of um, unintended pr pregnancies globally is 122 million, um, which is approximately half of all pregnancies. Um, and 257 million refers to the number of those who want to avoid pregnancy, but are not using safe and modern methods of contraception. And of these 257 million, 172 million are using no method at all. So as we pause and reflect on uh, the achievements and uh, the progress that remains to be done for reproductive health and rights, and as we think beyond ICPD after 30 years, uh, we really want to draw attention to a largely neglected aspect of reproductive health and rights. Uh, and that's the interconnectedness with population dynamics and environmental sustainability. Now, one of the reasons, there's many reasons why this really needs to be done, but one of the reasons that this is absolutely necessary to do is that making these connections can really help strengthen reproductive health and rights in, in many different ways. 
So it's well known and it's well documented that a healthy environment contributes to reproductive health um, and reproductive rights. But the reverse is also true uh, and far less celebrated. So advancing reproductive health and rights benefits environmental sustainability. And acknowledging this presents multiple opportunities to ensure policy coherence across different sectors, but also to strengthen reproductive rights. So there's ample evidence that global population size influences environmental sustainability uh, and drives climate change as well as environmental degradation. The sixth assessment report of the Interne Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, identified population growth and gross domestic product as um, the strongest drivers of CO2 emissions. In 2010, O'Neill and uh, his colleagues calculated that slowing population growth to the level of uh, the UN low variant projection uh, could lead to, um, could provide 16 to 29% of em emission reductions that are necessary to avoid dangerous climate change by 2050. So thousands of scientists around the world have also issued, uh, endorsed a, a global, um, a world warning of a climate emergency and stressed the need to not only reduce overconsumption and waste, but also to stabilize and gradually reduce the human population by advancing gender equity and human rights. So the current climate and environmental crisis we're facing have really reinforced the importance of fulfilling reproductive health and rights and of discussing population dynamics. And these environmental crises uh, are an existential threat uh, for all of us, but they also represent a, a major crisis of inequity as some population groups are disproportionately vulnerable to uh, its impacts. So because of their influence on fertility levels in particular, reproductive health and rights and environmental sustainability have a mutually reinforcing relationship. This, however, is not reflected in the way in which reproductive rights are conceptualized and how we discuss them. Um, the 1994 ICPD conference is widely known for really moving away from demographic targets and focusing global attention on reproductive health and rights. So at Cairo, population control programs that prioritize reducing fertility over the fulfillment of individual reproductive rights were largely denounced. And it has been argued that since, um, that basically that the Cairo conference really replaced the family planning movement with the reproductive health and rights movement, which in time became the sexual and reproductive health and rights movement that's really um, dominant today. But in this process, this has led to the rejection, to the entire rejection of discussions of the interconnectedness of reproductive health and rights, population dynamics and environmental sustainability, and to the perception that these discussions were tantamount to population control uh, as well as antithetical to a rights-based approach. So exploring the role that population size plays for environmental sustainability has also been criticized as being a dangerous distraction from the real drivers of climate change, such as capitalism and overconsumption, etc. cetera. Um, these discourses effectively divorcing reproductive rights and population dynamics are exemplified in um, many documents. Uh, there, for example, there, there's no reference to population dynamics in the sustainable development goals, creating a lot of policy incoherence. But also, for example, in the 2023 State of the World Population Report from the UNFPA, um, So in the Breaking the Silos report, we draw attention to the fact that the ICPD um, program of action did include a broad range of issues that were 
related to population and sustainable development, uh, including, for example, population growth, structure, health, urbanization, migration, etc. And that a narrow focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights that excludes these broader issues is really a misrepresentation of ICPD and of the range of important population and development issues that it covered. So in line with this, we aim to demonstrate that as we look beyond ICPD plus 30, um, the fulfillment of individual reproductive health and rights ought to be regarded as an integral part of broader development, sustainability, and demographic considerations, and should really not be dissociated from, from them. Uh, in the process of, the, of doing this, we're, we're really changing the framing um, of a social issue, and doing that can um, reinforce its moral appeal, and as well as diversify its support base. So the current dominant framing of reproductive health and rights consi considers them as being purely individual and really incompatible with broader collective and environmental goals. But it, recognizing that fulfilling reproductive health and rights influences population dynamics by lowering fertility means acknowledging the positive impact of uh, family planning on broader development sectors. Uh, including environmental sustainability. And doing this represents additional and wider frames for reproductive health and rights. Um, and these have the potential to appeal to new audiences. Um, citizens, policymakers, researchers, activists who are concerned with these wider issues. So these audiences may not otherwise be um, inclined to support reproductive health and rights. And so reintegrating population dynamics uh, within the reproductive health and rights uh, framework carries the potential to generate new champions to endorse reproductive health and rights. Um, broad concern among the general public um, uh, around the world for environmental degradation and climate change suggests that recognizing the synergistic nature of reproductive health and rights and environmental sustainability there is a potential to, to catalyze support for reproductive rights really far and wide beyond what it currently is. Now, the environmental community has been wary of addressing population dynamics and reproductive rights. Um, and within the reproductive health and rights movement, uh, there's tensions between, um, between this movement and sustainable development advocates are still continue to this day. Uh, but research really indicates that there is broad support among both reproductive health and rights and environmental advocates for framing reproductive health and rights in a manner that reflects its positive impact on environmental sustainability. So increasingly, this, this, this is a, a broader phenomenon um, because we're seeing a desire to break across silos um, to, to both acknowledge and respond to a multitude of interconnected crises that we're facing. You've probably heard of the poly crisis, these, these type of notions that really um, um, consider crisis as, a, as an integrated whole rather than an individual uh, amount of isolated ones. So addressing interconnected global crisis must be done in a holistic manner rather than by treating each issue in isolation. And ICPD plus 30, this provides us with an opportunity to reflect on a more integrated paradigm for reproductive health and rights, uh, a paradigm that recognizes its profound multi-sectoral implication. Achieving this cannot be done without acknowledging the significance of population dynamics and the crucial role that reproductive autonomy women's empowerment and access to family planning and reproductive health services play in the trajectory of demography change. So as we reflect on ICPD plus 30, we can learn from and build on existing frames that highlight intersectoral connections, uh, as well as create new partnerships 
A couple of examples include the planetary health and one health frame. Uh, there are interdisciplinary research approaches that center that are centered on the notion that the health of the planet and the health of the humans are interconnected. Another example, <clears throat> sorry, is the interdisciplinary population health and environment approach, um, which emerged from conservation-based organizations and recognizes the importance of prioritizing integrated solutions to health, gender, and environmental changes. So to finish, um, I'll just stress again that population trajectories should not be considered as being immutable. And uh, the United Nations lower projection, lower variance projection um, of a global population peaking at 8.9 billion in 2054 instead of 10.4 billion in 2086 is possible by advancing reproductive health and rights. Um, and so for all these reasons, population considerations can constructively be added in and prioritized in the ICPD plus 30 frame for reproductive health and rights, as well as in other health and environment uh, frameworks. Thank you. Very much, Celine. That's a, a good gallop through 28 pages of of a very, um, in a good way, um, dense report. And we will now hear from Joe Spidel, one of the other uh, co-authors of the report, who will expand on that a little bit. Um, Joe is a board certified physician and researcher in the field of public health, and he's Professor Emeritus at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. His previous positions include directing the USAID Office of Population, the President of Population Action International, and directing the Population Program at the Hewlett Foundation. He's the author of more than 300 scientific publications in the field of population and health. Uh, Joe, I'll pass over to you and um, please please speak up. We've had a couple of, of um, uh, things saying that the volume is a little bit quiet. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> hello, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me OK. Um, the thesis I'm presenting today is that the people and organizations working to better humanity and to save nature need a common agenda. And of course, I'm echoing what uh, Celine has already uh, told all of us. <clears throat> we need to recognize that the current lifestyle of humans is unsustainable. Increasing consumption and rapid growth of population numbers have resulted in unsustainable human demands being placed on essential natural resources. And the result is pollution, extinction of plant and animal species, damage to croplands, water shortages, depleted fisheries, loss of forests, and dangerous climate change. We face a daunting challenge, supporting billions of additional people, eliminating greenhouse gas emissions, reversing environmental, environmental degradation, and improving living standards for about 4 billion people, that's about half of us on this planet, who are living on $5 a day or less. Now, all of these problems are made worse by world population growth remaining at about 80 million a year. And this is fueled by lack of access to contraceptive information and services that leads to more than 120 million unintended pregnancies each year. The UN projects that world population will increase from the current 8 billion to between 8.9 and 12.7 billion in the year 2100 depending largely on how generously the world community supports international reproductive health and family planning programs. At present, the challenges relating to population and environment are not adequately addressed by the advocacy and action of concerned individuals, organizations, and governments. They too often avoid controversy and conform to organizational ideologies rather than being guided by established science. For example, advocates for women's rights, health, and welfare, welfare support reproductive justice, the right to choose the number and timing of childbearing, access to contraception, abortion, and equal rights and opportunities for women. Yet they often express a high level of fear that promoting smaller family size and acknowledge the links between population and the environment and climate 
will lead to coercive family planning programs. Family planning programs often are less beneficial than they could be because they limit access to teenagers, unmarried women, and women who need abortion care. Advocates for the environment often downplay the environmental impact of population size or rely on UN population projections that population will stabilize in size in the near future. These projections have repeatedly underestimated the speed and magnitude of future world population growth. For example, the 2022 UN projection for Africa's population size in 2050 is 2.9 billion. This is more than 1 billion higher than the UN projection for Africa made in 2002. Advocates for the environment typically advance solutions that rely on technology and behavior change, but ignore the synergistic benefit of lower population size. They point out the high consumption per capita of people living in wealthy countries, but seldom consider that as the five times more populous developing countries gain wealth and consume more, as they certainly deserve to, their contribution to environmental damage could exceed that of the currently wealthy countries. China, the number one emitter of greenhouse gases, is an example of the high consumption of a very large country emerging from poverty. The environmental community also has been wary of addressing population, contraception, and abortion because of fears that it would unnecessarily enmesh their programs in controversial topics. An emphasis on sexual and reprodu reproductive health and rights is a key component of a common agenda that policymakers should adopt. Education, women's equality and empowerment, and access to affordable, fully voluntary family planning and abortion services ensures that women are free to choose the number and timing of childbearing. The experience of many countries suggests that where voluntary contraceptive services are provided and promoted, average family size markedly declines. Reproduction, sorry, reduction of population pressure will not substitute for other measures needed to cope with and attenuate ongoing loss of ecosystems, extinctions, widespread pollution of land, water and air, and climate disruption, driven mainly by extensive use of fossil fuels and the release of greenhouse gases. Now here's, here's what I really wanna emphasize. Policymakers concerned with poverty and climate should recognize that with the exception of a few oil rich nations, no country has lifted itself out of poverty without first reducing its fertility rate. Additionally, we also need to recognize that no, no nation has achieved low fertility without extensive use of abortion, either legal or illegal. The Guttmacher Institute estimates that in 2019, there are 111 million unintended pregnancies in low and middle income countries, resulting in 68 million abortions and 30 million unplanned births. Fully funding family planning programs would reduce unplanned births from 30 million to 9 million per year and decrease abortions from 68 to 23 million a year. It has been suggested that decreased population growth through investment in family planning and female education would be a less costly way to bring about carbon abatement than investing in low carbon energy options such as solar and wind. The International Energy agency has called for outlays of trillions of dollars to combat climate change. The five billion per year needed to meet unmet needs for contraceptive services, that is five million additional needed per year to meet unmet needs for contraceptive services in low and middle income countries represents a bargain. It is appropriate to care about population dynamics, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and about the environment simultaneously. It is also appropriate for advocacy organizations and governments to provide educational messages about the value of small families for the welfare and health of mothers and children and for the economic benefits to their families, communities, and nations. As we consider the 30th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development, the still distant goals of the conference program of action should be addressed, especially adoption of appropriate population and reproductive health policies that consider the impacts of rapid population growth on a broad range of issues, including gender inequality, health, food security, poverty, 
the environment and climate and call for the provision of adequate funds to ensure that high quality family planning and basic reproductive health services are available worldwide. In today's era of forceful attacks on important population related issues, such as abortion rights and climate change, it is particularly important to build allegiances and support a common agenda. This would move advantageous policies, funding and programs forward and advance social and economic progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, and I think for, for those of us who are um, involved and interested in uh, questions of sexual and reproductive health and rights, one thing that we all know for sure is that this it, there's chronic underfunding uh, in, in this area, in some ways getting worse, the, um, uh, and that wherever we can mobilize support for this, this cause, it is critically needed. Uh, I'd like, now like to pass on to Florence. Um, Florence is a former award-winning journalist in her home country of Uganda, covering primarily issues related to women, development and health. She has a master's degree in population and development from the London School of Economics, from where she joined us in 2018. Uh, she now lives in the US, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she's also a member of Population Media Center's Program Advisory Board. Florence. Thank you so much, Alistair. And now after listening to you, uh, Joe and Celine, I feel inadequate to even say anything. I feel like they've covered everything, you know, amongst the three of them, but I'll do my best. So their discussion was really insightful. And it's from the, the research done by Celine and Joe that I got a quote that I've long believed about population growth in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Uganda in particular, in my own country. And I'll be showing that to you. Please allow me to share my screen in the meantime. Yes. So I'll delve into addressing how, into addressing how reducing high fertility rates to low birth rates in Sub-Saharan Africa can be a catalyst for broader empowerment of young girls and women and how it can lead to reduction of poverty, which is really a big thing. So I'll run so far through these because they've practically said everything that I was going to say. <laughs> so I'll start from, oh, sorry, the beginning, new slide. Yes, can enhanced reproductive health empower women in the fight against poverty? I strongly believe in this and let's, let me share. So Sub-Saharan Africa, which is my area of interest, uh, the population is growing. It's going to double by 2050. By 2050, we are doubling. Are we doubling the resources? Are we doubling the infrastructure? This is worrying and it's problematic. The total fertility rate, if you can see, if you compare Sub-Saharan Africa to the rest, you know, the world, South Asia, East Asia, from the 1960s up to now, our fertility rate has been persistently high. And of course, there are so many reasons. I don't want to get into them, and I see they've mentioned some of them. But yes, one of them is, you know, inadequate, you know, or lack of contraceptives. And right now, the rate is still so low, yet women want to use the contraceptives. And you can see my background really just says that. And Selena already mentioned the lack of, and the numbers are growing, 232 270 who come to that chart. So it's worrying. And the population growth is above 2.5%. Now, a population which is growing at 2.5% per year is doubling in only 27 years. Only 27 years. Imagine that. Others are above 100, 100 some even not even mentioned, then over 300. And for us, it's growing. And of course, the eight countries that are going to contribute to the big population by 2050 five are in Africa, including four in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here is an interesting, well, it's not interesting because by 2100, actually, about the some countries, including Chad, Niger, as well as South Sudan, they'll have eight times the population they currently have, eight times. So they've talked about peaking elsewhere. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the population is, going, is not going to peak by 2100. That's not going to happen. 
And what are we doing with all those numbers? So what is the impact of a population growth? So it makes it more difficult. This is from the UN. Uh, more difficult for low-income and lower-middle-income countries to afford the increase in public expenditures on a per capita basis that is needed to eradicate poverty and hunger and malnutrition and ensure universal access to healthcare. And trust me, when I was practicing, Alisa said I was a journalist, yes, covering Uganda, and I saw all of this really going on. There's been a bit of improvement, but you go to the rural areas, which make up most of our countries, it is, it is sad, over 70%. And in rural areas, poverty rate is at like 90%. So let's go into, you know, a bit of that. Extreme poverty, where are the 1.2 billion people who are poor? Well, they're concentrated in regions where the population continues to grow rapidly. And 579 million are in sub-Saharan Africa, only followed by, you know, South Asia. So this is really absurd. The population growth is outpacing poverty reduction. And a, a good example that I can give you is from Ethiopia, where from between 2011 to 2019, they reduced their poverty rate, the incidence of poverty from 83% to 69%. But the population that was poor increased by 2 million from 76 million to 78 million. And whenever this happens, obviously it mostly affects young girls and women and the gender snapshot report, if some of you have seen it, which was released by UN Women last year, says about 340 million young girls and women are going to be stuck in poverty by 2030. And they'll be living on less than $2, $2 a day. And some of them is under $1, trust me. So really poverty is quite a disease and it means no schooling, especially for the young girls. So you find that for the girls who don't go to school, about three quarters of girls in primary, you know, are not attending primary school. That is absurd. Where are these girls? What does no school mean? It means child marriages. It means childbearing, persistent childbearing, frequent childbirth. These girls are tied down, you know, to just give birth. And we know what comes with it. They have small bodies. I won't go into the science of it, but... That's why we have high maternal mortality rates in these regions. Uganda has about 330 of every 100,000. We come to countries like Nigeria, about 500. And of course, I saw US here going crazy over the maternal deaths. So I was like, wow, you guys have it easy. I think it's under 10. So I was like, wow, I wish we could get there. And that's the aim, at least to reduce it up to 70. But how are we going to get there? These are all the things that Joe and Selena have been discussing, you know, what gets us there. So I uh, will move on. So just the case of Niger, really, this is, well, it's, it's a bit of an outlier, but most countries or many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa actually are uh, relatively here as well. So Niger has over 27 million people and it's classed extremely low income. Honestly, if you want to know poverty, Yes, you might need to live in Niger for a day at least. So 12 million people, 12 million, extremely poor, not poor, extremely poor. So the rest are also really poor. Child marriages, the worst. 76% of child marriages. 5 million child brides. We are talking about children being married before they turn 15, before they turn 18. This is absurd. Look at their fertility rate. It has been persistently high. Thankfully, their president is now on board. He's like, mm, something needs to change. GDP per capita, 585. That is pathetic, of course. Says a Ugandan whose is 900 something. So still upside compared to, I mean, the US now where per capita is $40,000. Look at that huge difference. Honestly, it is absurd. Then of course, contraceptive prevalence rate, it is really low, one of the lowest in the world. Median age, 14. So yes, when I say population is not going to be peaking anytime soon in these regions, and Niger, like I said, is going to add eight times more than it, than in what it has. So do 27 and multiplies, you know. So their population growth rate, that is PGR, sorry, 3.75%, 3.75. Doubling in only 18 years, only 18 years. And of course, they still have, they are still struggling with under five mortality. There's a bit of improvement, and 
Yes, about 50% give birth before 18. That's why I said the population is going to continue growing and population growth usually affects the young girls and women. So in a country, I know maybe some of you have heard about the demographic dividend, which is really so coveted, but can a country like Niger, even my own Uganda, Nigeria, all countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, can they get anywhere near the coveted demographic dividend? For Benny, honestly, it's a no. You know, you have to be optimistic and pessimistic about this dividend. And this is simply the graph which just tell, tells it all. You know, it requires certain conditions to be in place. Look at the red, look at the green. Most of Sub-Saharan Africa is still stuck in the red. School dropouts, child marriage, early pregnancies, frequent, frequent you know, women dying, children dying, no health, you know. Reproductive choices totally stripped away, informal work, child illness, death. And these are the things pre-industrial area, you know, pre-transitional pre area in Europe, they used to experience high birth rates, high death rates, no work, women just giving birth, taking care of their children, you know. The same thing is still happening to us. You know, those were dinosaur years, but look at us now where we are still experiencing that, honestly. When do we get to the green? They tell us you have to save. Most people don't even have bank accounts and they don't even have the money to save. So it's really going to be a long distance. We are going to miss this opportunity whereby we're excited about this youth bulge. What are we doing for these young people? Most of them are under 15. You saw Niger. So how do we get there? I like, you know, UNFPA, how it sums up this access to sexual and reproductive health, including family planning can affect population dynamics through voluntary fertility reduction and reductions in infant and, and you know, maternal mortality. And of course, yeah, they say it also helps individuals, young women break out of intergenerational cycles of poverty. But right now there's no spacing, you know, we are passing on this poverty immediately. There's no intergenerational gap at all. So yes, it's absurd. So we need a fertility transition in Sub-Saharan Africa, honestly. And it's possible, you know, it's achievable. And everyone has talked about the positive means that we can, you know, achieve it. Alice talked about all the solutions. And if you look at this graph, it clearly tells you these countries, they had voluntary effective policies and look at their fertility rates, how they, how they came down. Fertility rate, by the way, I, uh, it's, you know, the number of children a woman will have throughout her reproductive years, you know, between 15 and 14 years of age. Look, under 25 years, these guys were able to reduce their fertility rates to this level. It is possible. It can be done. And most of them did it at low cost, you know, low cost. And what stood out the most? Education and modern public planning. All these solutions are vital, all of them to bring down you know, population growth and reduce it and ensure that you know, there are services enough to care for everyone. But education, modern family planning, there is really stood out. And of course, the sample we're always saying, is education, is educating girls the key to population stabilization? And some will give you a big, big yes, but others will say, you know, education, family planning, together, concurrently, you know, others say family planning. But for me, I believe it's both. And of course, family planning even stands out the most because you can have an educated populace, but if they do not even have access to family planning, then still useless. There's no agency at all. So I love this quote, like I started, you know, I got it from Celine's and Joe's report. No one doubts the value of empowering women through education, but when population grows this fast, countries are simply not able to sustain their development. And when education and health systems are overwhelmed, and believe me, they are very much overwhelmed or fail altogether, I can assure you it is women and girls who suffer first and most. Always, this population growth, it's affecting women. They're the ones, we're the ones getting pregnant. We're the ones giving birth. We're the ones going to the health centers and somehow being ignored. I once went to a health facility where this health worker said, Florence, Look at this line, they're here for family planning services. Look at these ones, they are pregnant. Look at these ones, they're sick. Okay, sick, sick, family planning. No, you're not sick, you guys go. Women go back and they don't come, they don't return. All these affect that, even if women know. So there's a lot that needs to be really done. And yes, this is the graph that I talked about. So reproductive justice, is it there when 270 million women 
and not using modern contraceptives when they would love to use them, there's no justice. So we need to ensure that we give it to them, honestly, because let's face it, high birth rates are not doing any favors to our young girls. They need to come down, you know, and there are so many things that we can do to reduce them. Yes, so family planning, so many benefits. I won't go into them. People have already talked about them, but, you know, each leads to betterment of lives of young girls and women. I see Alistair has shown up, so <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up so fast. So this is, you know, just effective national family planning programs where they have worked at low cost, and it's just amazing. You can look at some of the countries, Thailand, Iran, Vietnam, and even in Sub-Saharan Africa, by the way, Kenya is doing well, Rwanda, just perfect, amazing. And you can see that has had an effect. More women are now in government, they're in parliament. So that's amazing. So really, we shouldn't be fearing policy. This was a discussion the Minister of Health in Uganda was having you know, in parliament. And the deputy speaker was totally opposing giving contraceptives to young girls. But you've seen in, in Niger what happens, how young girls are giving birth the same. And one doctor was asking, should we let the children get pregnant and die at birth? All of them take family planning. And trust me, they're dying. They're dying. So we need to embrace the P word, really. ICPD, put it back. And this still is from Kanyoro. I won't really read it because of time. Slow population growth, reduce poverty, achieve economic progress, improve environmental protection, and reduce unsustainable consumption and production partners. All these things are mutually reinforcing. So ICPD, please bring back the P. And I love this is you know my former colleague. Uh, Andrew Chamagariko, also an ambassador for population balance. And he's one guy who used to believe in patriarchy. He was like high birth rights, they're fine, okay. Reproduce, you know, so he has religion. He admits that he has religion and he has culture on his side. But when he joined journalism and he was just promoting these, one time he came across a 13 year old who was going through everything that we've discussed and decided to change course. And for now he's saying family planning is not just a healthy tool, it is a development issue. So there is need for more investment. So thank you so much. So ICPD 20 means let's go. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Florence, as always. I saw Florence's original 25 slide um, <laughs> uh, presentation there, which contained even more information. But I think the key thing to say here is that, uh, is that most, if not all, of this information is available in the report Breaking Silos, um, which is available at breakingsilos.info. If you're registered here, you should already have received a link in your invitation. And do please, please read it all. And in particular, please share it with people that, that um, you think would benefit from it. Um, so I don't know whether you're still sharing your screen, Florence. Can you, uh, are you able to stop? Um, there. So um, we, we still have a few minutes left for questions, um, and we have a lot of questions, uh, needless to say, um, but I'm just going to um, pick a couple. And I think the first very important one um, to start with is I think we've really demonstrated, uh, you know, in this panel, the absolute central importance of, uh, of addressing population through empowering people, through family planning, through education, through all these other mechanisms that, that, that we've identified. But there is a legitimate concern that people have. And it's part of the reason why in Cairo 30 years ago, there was a move away from population policies, that there is a risk of coercive policies. There is a risk that, that addressing these issues will lead to, to, to uh, people, people's, uh, the barriers and their, and their freedoms being taken away. And I think it's very important that we, that, that we look at that and ask, uh, ask, is that still a risk and what can we do to mitigate it? Uh, if, if it is, uh, Celine, could I go to you first um, on that? Could you give us your thoughts? Uh, and you are slightly muffled in your presentation. Can you please speak um, uh, um, loudly and clearly? Thank you. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the question of coercion and um, population dynamics, uh, coercion for reproductive rights and, and population dynamics is really, um, it, it's, it's at the heart of this discussion really here, um, because this is what has triggered the reluctance to connect, uh, to connect both sectors. Um, I think that when we when we reflect on that, we we really need to keep in mind that 
um, some of the lessons of the, for example, the UNFPA State of the World 2023 report. I mean, I wasn't a fan of that report uh, in many ways because that report really rejected the role of population dynamics for sustainability and uh, any attempt at connecting reproductive rights and environmental sustainability. But one of the key lessons was that uh, population can go up or it can go down. We have population growth, we have fertility decline. And when we're devising policy responses to that, um, they shouldn't, there, there are some key pillars that we shouldn't depart from. And I would say that we take a we center reproductive autonomy. We don't need to create policies that go beyond the fulfillment of reproductive health and rights. Um, and so I, I think that as we keep that as our guiding principle, uh, really this is about fulfilling reproductive health and rights, making sure that every child is a wanted child and that every person truly has the ability, the very concrete ability to choose uh, the number, spacing, and timing of their offspring. This is what we're after. We're not after creating policies that um, are going to force people to have a certain number of children. Now, beyond this, uh, as Joe referred to, that I think that there's also value in having discussions around um, the, the the question of of sustainability and. Um, it, it, I think that it's worthwhile to promote messages that smaller families have many benefits for the planet and that fertility decline, population decline and population growth are not symmetrical problems. They're not identical. I mean, the, what's at stake uh, with population decline is very different from population growth. So my response to this question of coercion is really that no matter whether we're talking about population decline or population growth, we keep the same approach, which is fulfilling reproductive autonomy. And wonderfully, that's all we really need to do. Um, so I would say that um, as, as we look at the news, uh, for example, I don't know if you've heard, but President Macron in France has recently talked about the need to for rearmement démographique, which means to rearm demography so that we basically promote natality. So that I am, I would say, more worried about pro-natalism than, um, than attempts to really um, have population growth or become more stabilized. So I, I don't know if I answered correctly, but the, the guiding principle is reproductive rights, human-centered, um, individually, individual autonomy, and reproductive autonomy. And I think that this applies to any kind of demographic uh, situation, whether it's population going up or down. Thank you, Celine. And, and it, when you review things like the uh, UNFPA's report, also many other reports, the, the UN um, population Department actually publishes a review of population policies a, a, every two or three years. And what's really quite striking is we should never be complacent about the risk of coercive programs, but actually it, the U, uh, UN very specifically says that the majority of, of population policies have always been voluntary based. They've always been based on empowerment in these areas and, and things like China, India are kind, of, are kind of overshadow the, 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 the discussion of these, but those empowering policies are the ones that work. And I'll just put a quick plug in here for a report that we produced last year called Power for the People, which is looking at, at a number of very successful programs that address that. I'd also amplify as well what you said about pronatalism. In fact, the risk of pronatal policies, such as we're seeing in somewhere like Hungary, in which restrictions on abortion are just starting to come in associated with a pronatal agenda, which the Hungarian government has in Iran, we're seeing con contraception, family planning explicitly restricted in order to, order to boost population. There is a real threat there. We have to keep individual uh, uh, reproductive autonomy and rights um, uh, at the centre. Thank you. Um, Joe, um, question for you, I, I, I think here, someone has simply asked, can we hit the UN's kind of low target of 6.5 billion people by the end of the century? Is that an achievable 
goal or a thing that we could uh, that, that we could realistically expect to see? Uh, well, it's it's very hard to know exactly, but we do know that um, population programs um, are dramatically underfunded. And if we really stepped up and put the resources in to make access to reproductive health and family planning available as it should be, uh, we probably could see a possibility of uh, pursuing the UN low projection. Um, and I, I, I think it is possible. Um, I'd, I'd love to try that out and find out. <laughs> I, I think you're, yeah, you're absolutely right there. We simply do not know because we've seen chronic uh, uh, underfunding. We've seen a chronic lack of success in delivery. And, and let's remind ourselves in 2012, the there was a goal set for to have 120 million more women using uh, modern family planning by by 2020, uh, 60 million was achieved in that. And as Florence, indeed, the very, the very graphic behind Florence illustrates, one of the reasons is that actually service delivery is not actually keeping up with population growth, although we may have seen some increases in the proportion of women um, um, uh, um, uh, having their, their need met, actually the absolute number of, uh, of women is growing. Um, Florence, if, if I could come to you, um, about the, the the relationship between education and uh, and family family planning, can one work without the other? I would say they would work well together. If the two were provided concurrently, they would just be amazing. But obviously, if there are different cases, if you look at, you might find a country where you find that even the women who are not educated but they have access to family planning, you know they have smaller families, you know, and they're even taking their children to schools. But of course, I str I'm a strong believer in education. And I've seen someone asking, okay, how does family planning really help? You know, how does it help women? Well, looking at smaller family sizes, family planning enables couples to have the number of children they desire. So smaller families can allocate more resources per child, including education, healthcare, and nutrition, you know, so there's that ability. And thereby this improves their overall quality. And even the governments, by investing in family planning services, they can reduce healthcare costs associated with unplanned pregnancies, which are really high, and maternal and child health complications. You know, so while also increasing work productivity, so it's really most beneficial, especially for young girls and women who make choices, you know, about their families and they find jobs, they are part of that you know other opportunities they pursue different things so i feel like the two if they can be offered concurrently that would be the best the best option honestly thank you the very short period of time um left uh and i was just um uh, I think just very quickly, we have been talking obviously a great deal about the needs in low income countries and places where um, uh, where 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 needs are not being met. Of course, population is an issue too in high income countries. Family size is an issue in high in, uh, high income countries. Um, do, what, what do you think are quickly? I'll, I'll come to you you for this, Joe. A kind of the levers that, that that we can use in order to get people to think about the choices that they make regarding family size and the importance of those choices. And it will have to be a very quick answer, I'm afraid. Well, I one thing I would point out is that in countries that run really first rate family planning programs like Thailand, the difference between educated women and women who basically had no education kind of disappeared. Whereas in, if you don't have such a great program, then those then we find that education is uh, very powerfully associated with use of family planning. Um, I'm not sure that gets to the, uh, to the question. Uh, so I, I, I'd rather put you on the spot there with one minute to go. Um, so it's a shame I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions here. We've only been able to answer a few, but as I say, we're taking note of those questions uh, and we will try to um, 
uh, respond to people either tomorrow. We will be, we hope, um, putting this uh, the recording of this event um, online. Uh, if not tomorrow, then certainly a day or two later. Uh, and we'll also be producing a blog on our website, which is populationmatters.org, um, which goes into more detail about about the report. I repeat again, um, breakingsilos.info. Please do share. Please do read it all. It's very much. Um, worth doing so. We're immensely grateful to, to Joe and Celine for joining us um, uh, here. Sorry, Florence, did you want to say something? But <laughs> so I'm going, oh, by the way, Nyende, I've seen you, he's from Uganda and he says we should involve men. Definitely male involvement is important. Thank you so much for joining from the so breaking silos, I'm going to the CSW 68 in New York, as Alistair said. Please, if you're going just text me and let's link up. I'll be giving out the reports. Someone said, is this report going to the UN? I'll make sure I find the responsible guys and hand it over and t-shirts and everything. So just write to me. Thank you, Alistair. Thank, thank, thanks for saying that. Also in addition, um, Florence and I will be going to the Commission on Population and Development in, in New York, uh, UN's um, primary um, uh, meeting in order to look at these issues where again, we will be promoting this report and its findings and hoping to build bridges where people have concerns over population within the reproductive rights community. We understand those concerns, but we think yes. as this report, report very clearly uh, de demonstrates it's time to actually to start talking, to look at those opportunities we have for additional funding, additional champions, additional support that Celine was talking about. So thank you very much again, Joe and Celine, and to Karen Hardy, the, the, the third author for this excellent report. Thank you to all of you for joining us. If you are working in, the, in this field, um, we thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, we wish everyone a, um, a wonderful and productive International Women's Day this Friday. Thank you all for joining. Goodbye.